from his word. Exodus 3, I'll read verses 1 through 3. Find your place, say amen. amen. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. Moses has been gone from Israel for some 40 years. He has been watching his father-in-law Jethro's sheep on the backside of the desert. He believes that he left, he dropped the ball, that he failed, that he missed God back there in Egypt. And now he is living basically in despair. He's just going along. He's just surviving every day of his life. What what Moses did not realize is that God had him on the backside of the desert because God was preparing him. See those people down there in Egypt in bondage, they didn't need a prince to come and lead them out. Uh, they needed a shepherd. Matter of fact, when they get ready to go into Jordan, across Jordan into the Canaan land, they don't need a shepherd anymore to go and conquer the land. They need a warrior. So God moves Moses out and puts Joshua in. Isn't it just like God to get you on the backside of the desert? Get you way down low. Some of you tonight may be way down low. Feel like you're all alone. Feel like you missed something with God. But it's just God uh, getting you out there where he can prepare you, where he can train you, where he can get you where he needs you to be to use you for what he needs to use you for. And here Moses comes with that flock and he looks over and he sees a bush burning and the bush is not consumed it's not burned up and in verse 3 he says this I will now notice that word now I'm glad thank God later we'll not touch on it tonight so I'll touch on it in the introduction God will tell him come now and I'll send you down to Pharaoh into Egypt one thing about our God he's not a yesterday God uh, he's not a tomorrow God uh, I'm glad we serve a right now God God. He is the God that is. I'm glad for what he did for me in the past, the God that was. I'm glad for what he has prepared for me in the future, the God that will be. But I'm fighting hell by the acre. I'm looking at temptation and trial. I'm trying to serve God right now, not just in the sweet by and by, but in the nasty now and now. And I'm glad that my God is a God of the now. And Moses said, now, right now, I'm not waiting till next week. I'm not waiting till revival meeting. I'm not waiting till some big evangelist comes along. He said, right now, I will turn aside and see. Now Moses has, if you look at verse number one, though he may be in despair, I believe he's living in defeat. He has been active in what God has him doing. You see those words in chapter three, verse one. Moses kept the flock of Jethro. Moses led the flock of Jethro. Uh, Moses came to the mountain. He's been active. And one of the things about God's people is it's not time. No matter where God has you, no matter what God's doing in your life, it is not time to sit down and twiddle our thumbs. Don't spend all day watching Fox News wondering about what Russia's are doing. Uh, all you got to do is open your Bible. And God said it some 3,000 years ago at what's going on. It is not time for us to pull aside, quit our jobs, and wait on some mountaintop. It is time for us to be active. But if we're not careful, being active, even for the Lord, can be distracting. It can pull us away from what really matters. And I say tonight, church, that you and I, as God's people, ought to right now turn aside and see. And for just a few minutes from these verses, I want to preach on that thought. Turn aside and see. If you'll go with me again to verse number three, I think that we should understand or turn aside and see. Now please uh, look over me. I'm just a country boy. I don't know them big words and I don't know how to make them big uh, outlines. I just use stuff that I, I understand. I hope you can understand it. But I think verse three, we ought to turn and see, turn aside and see the wow 
of the Lord. Yeah, we go to the ball game and somebody makes a great play and we go, wow. We turn the news on and see something and we go, wow. And then we come to the house of God and we've got so accustomed to hearing the stories of the Bible, to hearing what God has done and what God will done. And we let it just rush over us. But I'm telling you, you walk through this book and you look at what's actually going on. I mean, we're standing with Moses looking at a bush that's on fire, but it's not consumed I don't know what you say, but I say, wow. Yeah. Moses said, I think I'll turn aside and see the wow of the Lord. Watch what he said. Verse number three, he said, I'll now turn aside and see. Watch how he said it. This great sight. He didn't say I'm going to turn aside and see this sight. When I was growing up, my mama always talked about two places. She always talked about one of the islands of Hawaii she wanted to visit and uh, uh, Niagara Falls. And in our travels in evangelism, we first started, we were running everywhere and we was only a couple of hours from Niagara Falls. I told her, call her and get us a room. We're going to the falls. And when I stood at those falls and heard that rush of water and watched that river run drop over, I went down the elevator. How many of you ever been there? That's a wow moment in my life. And I thought we went down, walked on them walkways, and you had to put on a poncho and all. That water's a spraying on you. And I thought, wow. But I thought, wow. How in the world could anybody believe this happened by accident? I mean, I turned aside and saw that great sight, all of that water, all of them falls. They have to dam it up. They have to intentionally stop it to make it quit running. Hallelujah. God turned it on, and God can turn it off. Turn aside and see this not just a sight hallelujah but when you're talking to God and you're talking about God it is a great sight as I look back through my life as this lady testified about her granddaughter my mind rushed back to standing in the hospital and having the doctor tell me he'll never wake up he'll never walk he'll never talk but he's I think he went out with Jordan but when you look at it you're looking at a great sight hallelujah when everybody else said there's no way I'm glad God made a way I'm impressed tonight by the wow of God the much of his wow found in that word great let me just go ahead and tell you everything God does is great it's not the normal let me just tell you this we've heard these stories until they don't mean anything but they throw three men in a fire, cranked up seven times. It's melting gold. Takes about 1,900 degrees to melt gold. They cranked it up seven times. It's 13,000 degrees. It didn't burn them. It didn't even get the smell of smoke on them. It was so powerful and he, the heat was so high. It killed those. And sometimes we just go by that like it was nothing. I'm telling you, I'm the king, pagan, idol worshiper, all caught up in himself, looked down in there and said, we, didn't we throw three men in? But I see a fourth man. Wow, that is a great sight. You ever thought about this? God stood, according to the psalmist, God stood the water of the Red Sea up and it congealed. I don't know a lot, but if you added sugar, wouldn't you have had jello? I mean, I may be wrong. That's what I always thought. It congealed. If there's a weaver ancestor in the bunch, I promise you, as he's walking along, he stuck his finger in it. And not only did he stand the waters up, but they walked over on dry ground. When I look at that, I say, wow. It would have been good enough if he'd have just peeled some water back and we'd have went over in knee-deep water or we'd have went over in waist-deep water or maybe even ankle-deep or had to slush around in the mud to get across to get the freedom. But he doesn't just show you a sight. He shows you a great sight. I'll stand the waters up. I'll dry up the land. I'll drown Pharaoh, army, horse, and rider. What a great sight. The much of his wow. But I want to show you this. I kind of touched it, but I want to see it. He said, why the bush, verse 3, is not burnt. 
Why is it not consumed? Why is it not burned up? Not only the mu much of his wow, but I see the miracle of his wow. God can step into a bush out there on the backside of the desert, set it on fire with his glory and not consume it. Now that may not mean a whole lot to you until you realize that Paul said we have this treasure in earthen vessels. God moved out of heaven if you will and moved down on the inside of me and the fire, our God is a consuming fire living down on the inside of me but I'm not burned up. I got the power of heaven. I've got the God of heaven. I've got God living down on the inside of me. He is set set me aglow and yet I'm not consumed. He set me on fire and yet I'm not burned up. The miracle of him. All I can say is wow. I always remember where I come from. A nobody headed nowhere. My wife's here so I can tell this. My first little puppy love girlfriend was at church. Her mama found out that we were talking and she went to her daughter and said leave Sidney Weaver alone his family is no good his debt is no good they've not ha ever had anything they're not going to ever be anything leave him alone now she's still alive her mother I just preached at my home church she's still a member there and I reminded her and I said you didn't know that the Lord was going to come down there on the poor white trash side of town and save her no because she was right my family was no good. My daddy was no good. We had nothing. We had no prospects to get anything. We were headed nowhere. And you didn't know God was going to come down there on the mill hill and save me and fill me with the Holy Ghost. And I may not look like much, but he set me on fire. And I'm not what I used to be. And I'm not what everybody, glory to God, I'm not whatever. I am a walking, talking miracle of God. Wow. The wow of the Lord. As we continue on in verses 4 and 5. I'm trying to get past that, Pastor. I look around at some of you. You know some of your friends and said, wow. But in verses 4 and 5, we'll see the work of the Lord. Now watch this. Verse 4, it says, And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, when he got serious about it, God got real serious about it. He's watching the much of God's wow. He's seeing the miracle of God's wow. But it's about to get better now. Because God said, I saw you. You turned aside. You left everything else. You put your phone down. You're not worried about work tomorrow. You left the flock. You're not worried about what people are going to say. You're not worried about what the newscast is. You're not worried about where you're going to eat supper at after church. And you've turned aside to see. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside, God's really about to go to work now. What's this? He turned, saw that he turned aside to see. God, what's this big word? Called unto him out of the bush Moses trying to figure out the wow of God and all of a sudden God said Moses Moses I ain't heard God call my name in a long time good idea you ain't turned aside to see cause if you turn aside to see God will see that you turned aside to see and he'll go to work the first thing he does when he saw that Moses turned aside to see is in his work is he called Moses he started talking to Moses I mean I don't know about you but I want to be so close to God uh, I want to be like the apostle John who laid his head on the Lord's chest at the supper when you got your heart, uh, head laid on God's chest every time God's heart beat John heard it I ain't heard the heart beat of God sound like you're too distracted you're busy you may be doing some good things for God but you need to turn aside and see every time the, uh, the Lord breathe in and breathe out that breath 
went across John the Apostle's face. We used to sing an old song when I was coming up in church. Holy Spirit, breathe on me. You say, well, God ain't breathe on me. You way out there distracted. You're doing some good things. You're working for God. You're doing what it has. But put all that stuff aside and turn aside and see. Get real close. Well, where I'm from, we call it scooching up. Scooch up and you'll feel the breath of God. Here's what I'm getting to. When the Lord spoke, John didn't have any problem hearing him. Peter and them said, you're close to him. They made sign and all. Said, you're close to him. Ask him who it is that's going to betray him because you're real close to him. He said, well, I ain't heard him call my name. Well, I'm here to tell you, he ain't close enough. Because if you turn aside and see, you get wowed by the wow of the Lord. The Lord again. Listen, He inhabits the praise of His people. When you get enamored with Him, when you get caught up with Him, He get enamored with you. He'll get caught up with you. You start praising Him, He'll step right in the middle of it. He likes it. And Moses turned aside, and I can see him looking. You know, he didn't run up to that bush. He's standing off over here and he's checking out kind of not from a distance but not as close as he could be and all of a sudden God began to speak to him Moses Moses the work of God begins with a call look at verse number 5 and God said to him Moses Moses and Moses said here I am here Lord I'm right here verse number 5 he God said Draw not nigh hither. Don't come any closer yet. Stay right where you are. Don't move. What's this? It, it's not that God didn't want him in there close. God's got to show him something before he lets him get in there close. He said, draw not nigh hither. Don't come any closer right yet. He said, take off your shoes for you're standing on holy ground. I tell you, the God gets to working, the first thing he'll do is he'll call. The next thing he'll do is he'll change things. See, Moses, according to verse 1, was on the back side of the desert. That's the poor white trash side of town. That's the outcast. That's the outer suburbs. That's away from everybody. Out there, they not in a bunch of springs of water and palm trees. They just old scraggly bushes and a whole lot of sand and a whole lot of sun and a whole lot of dry. And I came to Florence, Kentucky tonight to tell somebody, it may seem like you're all alone. It may seem like God is a million miles away. And you say, my life's kind of been alone and it's kind of been dry and it's kind of been, but I'm telling you, it may be rough and the sun beating down on you and situations are overwhelming you but if you'd stop tonight and turn aside and see you know what God does here he said I just changed your desert into holy ground cause anywhere God gets uh, the situation is about to change Bryce is laying down in the Charleston Medical University. Tubes run in him everywhere. Breathing machines, pick lines, all kind of IVs. And the doctor said 50-50 chance he'll wake up. And if he wakes up, it's a 50-50 chance that he'll probably never walk, be a vegetable. I walked out of the room, me and my wife standing there, young married couple with no prayer chains, with no cell phones. Wasn't no way to get a hold of anybody. It's just me and her on the back side of the desert all by herself in a dry, de defeated place. She's sitting there, I can tell you. Didn't know windows open. Didn't know doors fly open. But all of a sudden, somebody stepped up right in between us. And I'm telling you, it felt like to put, the, put his arms around us and pull us in close. My wife leaned into me and said, did you feel that? And I said, if you knew what was going on, you know what was happening? God was changing our desert into holy ground. Mama threw both hands up and said, Lord, if you want him, take him. He's yours anyway. But if you leave him and he's a vegetable, I'll take care of him till the day you, you say how? Go to Mama at that time our baby boy. How could she say that? I'll tell you how. God had went to work in that hospital room and turned our downtime, turned our desert into holy ground. He had shown up. 
I remember when I was pastoring and working, I was driving a truck. And I was listening. I don't remember the song. I didn't normally cut the radio on, but I was kind of in a bad mood. I was kind of defeated over something or kind of beat down by it. And I, I turned the song on. I, it won't come to me exactly what the song was, but turned the radio on and it just started singing. And I don't know, but all of a sudden God got in that truck cab with me. And it got so real. First thing I did, I cut the radio off. Then it got so real that I kind of started driving instead of like this. I got over like that. You say, why would you do that? Because I felt like if I looked over there, he was going to be sitting there. I could say that's how real he was, and he was going to be sitting there. And I don't know about you, I don't need visions and dreams. I don't need to see the Lord. I'll just trust him by faith. It pleases him better that way anyway. So I was sitting like that, and he just kept getting bigger. And he just kept getting bigger. And I started just thanking him. I didn't know what to say to him, so I just said, bless you, and thank you, and praise you, and magnify you. And he got so big, I finally had to pull the truck over on the side of the interstate. I pulled the truck over, and I got out, and I got on the safe side, on the opposite side of the truck. And I was over there, and he done got so big, swelled up in me, I couldn't do anything but shout and make a fool for Christ out of myself. I was over there kicking and a stomping. You know what he had done? It took my down time he took my defeat and got in the cab of that old truck and turned it into holy ground I was standing out there on the side of interstate 26 and I was a blessing his name I was a praising his name and I heard somebody pull over go check on me and make sure I was alright and I come around the front of that truck about the time they was pulling over grabbed a bumper on that big truck and said glory to my God they squealed tires and went on out of there Sometime God will get you all by yourself. He'll get you in your lowest moment so he can really work in your life and change your desert into holy grail. Take off your shoes, Moses, because you're not on desert anymore. You're on holy grail. All I know to say is, wow. I give you this and I'm finished. Verse Number six, I want us to see, turn aside and see the worth of the Lord. He said in verse number six, moreover, Weaver's country dictionary of biblical words means that word moreover means there's more and more and more. I don't know if you understand it, but I'm about half give out now. Voice is starting to crack and I'm sucking for air. And God come along and said, wait a minute, Moses, there's more. Wait a minute, Emmanuel, there's more. You thought that was wild? You thought that was wonderful? You thought God was working? Hang on, there's more. There's more. He said, moreover. It's what God said. He said, I am. You always remember, that's God talk. I am the God of your fathers. Watch this now. He said, the God of Abraham, comma, the God of Isaac, comma, the God of Jacob, comma. He didn't put them all together because I believe he wanted you to know his worth is found in. He is a personal God. He didn't just say, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now here, he said, I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the same God for Isaac. I'm the same God for Jacob. I'm the same God for Pastor Foster. I'm the same God for Evangelist Weaver. I'm the same God for you. I'm the same personal. Thank God he's not just the God way up in heaven. He's not just the God over there on a hill. He's not just the God down here at the house but he's the God down in every one of us born again's heart. He is a personal God. But not only is he a personal God, his worth is seen in he is a particular God. Watch it, it's found in these names. He said, I am the God of Abraham. When he said to Moses, I'm the God of Abraham, he was telling Moses, I'm the God of covenant. If you read Genesis chapter number 12, you'll find out that God make promises to Abraham 
And the Bible says that when God could swear by no higher, he said, Moses, uh, Abraham, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you an heir from your own loins through Sarah, your wife. I swear it to you. I swear by me. Because when he could swear by no higher, he swear by himself. When you get to uh, Genesis chapter 15, they're getting ready to cut the covenant. Uh, Abraham takes the animals and he divides them out. He lays out the birds. He's beating the buzzards off of them uh, and waiting on what he's waiting on is the Shekinah glory of God to come down. And he and the Shekinah glory of God are going to walk between those pieces and cut a covenant. You ever wondered why at a wedding the groom family sits on one side of the church the bride sit on the front uh, other side they don't come in together after they are pronounced and introduced as Mr. and Mrs. they take hands and they walk between those two families out together you know what they're doing they're not just entering into a contract they stood before God and cut a covenant and the God uh, Moses, uh, Abraham is waiting on the covenant God to get there and walk with him between those pieces and cut a covenant but does anybody know what Abraham was doing when God this kind of glory God showed up I'll tell you what he's doing the Bible says a horror of great darkness came over him and Abraham fell into a deep sleep Weaver's country commentary says it got so dark he couldn't see his hand in front of his face and it was scary dark. You ever been where it was scary dark? And he fell into a deep sleep. Weaver's commentary says he is sawing logs. He is in a coma-like sleep. And the Shekinah glory of God came down and walked between the pieces. Abraham was laying over our sleep. That's why when Abraham went into Hagar's tent, he's going to help God out to give him an heir. God didn't come along and say, you broke the contract. I'm taking it back. I'm kicking you out. I'll find me somebody else, and I'll start a new nation. No, he told Abraham, just hang on, son. I'm going to give you everything I promise, because the covenant didn't rest in Abraham. He is asleep. It rested in me. I told you this morning when Jesus was paying our sin dead at Calvary, God got over. You ever wonder why it went dark? God got over. I don't believe it just the sun got blocked out. I believe God cut the Genesis 1-3. Let there be light. He cut that light out and it got a dark in the whole universe. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face and the Father stepped down to Calvary and in the darkness which locked me out and locked him in, they cut a covenant. So when I sinned after I got saved, I didn't lose my salvation. I'm not going to hell because the covenant's not resting in me. It's resting in him. It's it's his hand with his blood fulfilled with his body they're nailed to his cross and he said Moses I am a covenant keeping covenant making God Amen. then he said I'm the God of Isaac when he said he's the God of Isaac Abraham's the covenant making God covenant God Isaac is the God of completion cause I had to be some of them women Sarah said, the Lord came by here with two angels. And I heard him tell Abraham, I'm going to have a baby. I'm going to have a baby boy. They said, hey, man, praise God, Sarah. And then when Sarah went around, they said, let's pray for Sarah. She's lost her mind. She thinks she's going to have a baby at 90 years old. Bless her. But when the time of uh, childbearing was come, and the midwife walked out of Sarah's tent and said, Abraham, it's just like God said. Hey, you got a baby boy. What are you going to name him? He said, I'm going to call him Isaac. And every time I call his name and every time I look at him, I'll know what Paul would later say in the book of Philippians for being confident of this very thing, that he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it, will complete it, will see it all the way through to the day of Jesus Christ. If he started something hang on to it honey he'll see it all the way through right. as a master sculptor doing a sculpting class and he had a tarp over something and he said I'm going to yank this tarp off and you students write down immediately what you see and he said here we go he reached and pulled that tarp off and the students all looked at it and wrote down he went around the class little class and all the students said 
we see a big block of marble. Finally, one of the students said, Professor, what do you see? He said, I see a marble elephant. He said, we don't see that. All we see is a big block of marble. He said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take this hammer and I'll take this chisel and I'll knock everything off of that block of marble that doesn't look like an elephant. And when I get finished of working, you'll see then what I see now. You look up here, you don't say, you say, well, you don't look nothing like Jesus. Hang on. He's still taking the hammer of his word and the chisel of his spirit. And one of these days, I'll be running down Main Street Boulevard in that city John saw, and you'll grab me and stop me and say, hey, you was old weaver. We used to support our evangelist. I say, yes, I was. You say, you know what? You look just like Jesus. He's pre don't choke, don't choke on this word. But this Bible said that he had predestinated to conform me unto the image of his son. He's not finished with me yet. He's still working on me. And when he gets everything knocked off, I'll be exactly what he said I'll be. And you'll see then what he sees now. He's the God of covenant, Abraham. He's the God of completion, Isaac. And then we come to my favorite, Jacob. He's the God of compassion. Now Malachi 1 says it, and the book of Romans says it. And I didn't talk to the pastor before, but I'm going to deal with it the only way I know how to deal with it. Malachi 1, Romans, I believe it's chapter 9. Paul quotes from the Old Testament prophet, God said... Jacob I loved. Esau I hated. Whew. What are we going to do with that? Well, I've been running around telling that Jesus loved everybody and he said I hated Esau. What are we going to do? Everybody gets tore up about hating Esau. Well, I'm an old country boy. I wasn't raised by a preacher. I didn't come up in a preacher's home. I didn't have no preachers in my family. My daddy was an old head busting, hard nosed, mean as a rattlesnake, ill all the time, hated everybody. They called him a racist one time, and he said this to quote in the newspaper. He said, There's no way I can be a racist because I hate everybody equal. He told them to print it in the newspaper. And I believed he hated me. I understand. Esau was an idolater and a fornicator. And the Bible said he was a profane person. Profane at its base root means not only the enemy of God, but a hater of God. And God said, you don't want me, then I don't want you. You reject me, I reject you. If you want to say it, I know it'll choke you. You hate me, I'll hate you. God, no. I know, I know. I just tore some of you, oh, how in the world. But I'm telling you, that crowd that rejects Christ will go to hell without any repentance. Well, Esau tried to repent. Yes, he tried to repent because he missed out on all them things. He missed out on them blessings. He wasn't trying to get right with God. He wanted to get all that money and all that land. He wanted to get in on the stuff. God ain't saving you for the stuff. Hallelujah. God wants you to turn aside and see him. So I don't really struggle. You may be struggling right now with that, but I don't struggle with that. Matter of fact, my daddy said... If somebody hates you, don't worry about it, son. Just hate them back. <laughs> what I struggle with, honest, is that Jacob was a con man, hill snatcher. Now, I'm going I'm to go ahead and tell you this because some of you all tore up. I believe God rejected Esau because Esau thought nothing of the things of God. Sold them for a bowl of beans. Didn't think nothing about them, did you? And I believe that he received Jacob because Jacob wanted them so bad he'd steal for them. He'd lie for them. He didn't have enough faith to wait on God, but his heart was after the things of God. And somehow, though, listen, where I'm from, I can't tell the difference in them. Both of them ain't worth the gunpowder it take to blow their heads off. But God said, Jacob, I love. I'm going to tell you this. You turn aside and see, you'll find he's got big, two big arms. He'll wrap them around you. Nobody else may seem 
to love you. You may think you're unloved. You may think you're an outcast. But turn aside and see the worth of the Lord. He loves me. He loves me. If he could love old sorry Jacob, he could love old sorry Sydney. I'm glad, thank God, that I can tell you tonight, turn aside and see, and he'll show you how much he loves you. He loves me. He loves me. I close with this. When I was a little boy, uh, girls would take a flower or a weed and they'd pick it. He loves me. He loves me not. He lo- okay, I'll admit it. Maybe I did it a time or two myself. When I was a young pastor, just started out, I went and heard a big time preacher preach and he preached that God didn't love everybody. Jesus didn't love everybody. And I was thinking, Lord, how could he be the propitiation of our sins and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world if he didn't love them enough to die for them? How could he be savior of everybody? How could he say, if you're coming to me, I will in no wise cast you out. So I went home and I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Lord. I'm going to open this book and I'm going to start at Genesis 1-1 and if I find one page that says you didn't love me, I'm going to burn my Bible. I'm going to burn my ordination and license. I'm going to go back to driving a truck and loading them. And I'll never preach in your name again. And I started in Genesis. And I saw Adam in the garden. And he failed. He rebelled against God. And he plunged the human race into sin. But the Bible says that at evening, like every evening before, the voice of God came calling for Adam. And the Holy Ghost said, He loves you. I got over to Exodus 12 and the firstborn was about to die. That may not mean anything to you, but it my house I'm firstborn and I'm about to die but he said if you'll put the blood of that lamb on the doorpost in the lintel he didn't say I'll come by and open the door and look in and see who's worthy he said no when I see the blood all I gotta see I don't have to know who's in the house all I gotta see is the blood and the Holy Ghost said he loves me over in Leviticus says anointing the high priest ear and big th- uh, big th- uh, his thumb and his big toe with oil and blood. I don't know what all of that means, but the Holy Ghost said you have a high priest who's touched with the feelings of your infirmities. He loves you. And we got over in Daniel, and Daniel wouldn't stop praying, and they put him in a den of lions. I got in there with him, and they put us in a den of lions, and we laid our head on Leo, and we pulled another up there and covered up with him, and they didn't bite us or growl. I got in a fiery furnace with three Hebrew boys, and the Lord showed up, and the Holy Ghost said he loves me. I seen John, a wild man, coming out, pointing and saying, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And the Holy Ghost said he loves you. I'll go run ahead. I got all the way on the Isle of Patmos with an exiled apostle named John. And John said, Now unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. I found out as I went through this Bible that he loved me. He loves 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 me. I never got over the fact that Jesus loves me. Church, why don't you turn aside and see? Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for the truth of your word and the power of the Holy Ghost. Take the feeble left of thy servant. Speak to our hearts. May we take just a few minutes and turn aside and see the wow of the Lord, the work of the Lord, and the worth of the Lord. The pastor's coming. Grant it to be so, I pray, for Jesus' sake. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.